Hey everybody, this is Hayden Robel from BAby.com and joining me today is Augusto Quijano. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Quijano. Quijano, okay. Yeah. See, uh, last time I did an interview with um, John Cañellas from uh, Death's Gambit, if you've seen that game at all. Oh, uh, I haven't. Oh, well, it's a, it's a fantastic game. You should go check it out. But I also butchered his last name as well. So it seems like, <laughs> a, weird, seems like a weird trend of whenever I ask uh, for an interview, it's always someone with a uh, like, particularly Spanish last name. That, is that where you're from? Yeah, I'm from Mexico. Okay. Uh, it is a uh, Spanish last name. Right. Okay. And it's a weird one. It's like a lot of <laughs> is the the J is what's uh throwing people off cuz it's like a H sound, but it's a J, yes. so. Right, yeah. And for people for people like me in San Francisco, I'm very much used to uh the diversity of names as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you guys are over there Definitely. in on, Ontario right now, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, in Toronto. Cool. Toronto's super diverse as well. Yeah, so were you, uh, before this interview started, you were telling me that you actually were having your uh, office party. Sorry to take you away from that, by the way. Congratulations on the game. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. It just, like, it ended. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, it's not like, it, it was just like today, like, at noon, we just, like, chill for a bit, have some beers and uh, nice. and play some video games. It's what Rocket kind of games League. Do you play over there? We're playing uh, Rocket League and uh, okay. Towerfall oh, and... Uh, we're also playing. I don't know if you play. Uh, uh, what's it called? Like Drawful and Fibbage. No. no, actually, I've never heard of those. Are those, are those games <laughs> so or card good. games? Yeah, they're uh, they're games. Is, I think it's because uh, that sounds uh, like a card Jack game in the Box. Oh, Jack yeah, Box, yeah. Jack Box TV. Yeah. yeah, and Drawful and Fibbage are amazing. So it's just I don't, like, see, silly I, I've always been game. tempted to get that game because it sounds like the perfect party game. Yeah, it's fantastic. I really That's recommend awesome. it. So we're playing a bunch of that. And, um, and yeah, and yeah, I'm back. And back you guys home. are just celebrating uh, the launch, which is next week. And by the time this interview comes yes. out, probably either the day of or maybe Monday. So uh, yeah. you'll, you'll be hearing this is pretty fresh for everyone. We're going to try to keep this as not uh, – we're going to try to keep this as spoiler-free as possible, but there might be a few things that might slip into the into this interview, but hopefully they're mm-hmm. not too big. So I wanted to ask, actually, you guys are pretty small in uh, Drinkbox Studios, correct? You guys only have 10 people, apparently. Yeah, it's around that. It kind of fluctuates. Um, when, like at the end of production, usually we hire some some more people to do like yeah. some contract work uh, if we need some uh, some more help with that. So it usually starts like pre-production. It's like half the team, like four or five people, mm-hmm. and then it's slowly people start to roll into the the projects. Yeah, and then it grows. I think at one point we're like seventeen or something like that. It's still pretty small for the level and scope of like something like Guacamelee. Like, what was the height hmm. of Guacamelee's development for? Your uh, I think it was even less than that. I think. Really? Wow. Uh, yeah, it's like a, a bunch of people uh, work on it, but yeah, not a lot of people overlap at the same time. I guess. Okay. So, yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, and 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 sometimes like you know you lose people because they move or or something else you know so it's still a very unique position for you guys to be like ar- arguably in my mind probably the mo- one of the most prominent um canadian independent developers in oh thanks so, yeah so yeah I, there's I uh... say that like your games do feel super polished for the size of your team as well oh thanks yeah, yeah. we work hard on that and uh... <laughs> I'm sure you guys do. This this interview has been in the making for a long time, hasn't it, Augusto? I know, I know. Like I've been talking had... to you. I've been bugging you for like six months. Since December. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. we were um we were talking at uh PSX. Right. Was it? Yes, it was PSX. Um, we handed you that pink a business card of ours. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah, it's been long in the making because like we're just like, yeah, we should wrap up soon and you know uh-huh. how it is it kinda uh-huh. dragged a bit and all that stuff and I 
had to keep pushing you. It's like, oh, oh that, hey, there's already, no problem. In fact, already. honestly, hey, no, no, no hard feelings or anything like that. I think it actually worked oh, out yeah, perfectly yeah. because now it's closer to the release of the game and it'll work out a lot better. Yeah, it's finally there's gotten, some reading room, yeah. Yeah, and it, it gave me the chance to also be able to play the game pretty extensively now. I'm about three hours mm-hmm. in, so I haven't been able to beat it yet. Oh, fantastic. But uh, three hours in now, I'm at the, uh, without spoiling it, I guess I'm at like the mm-hmm. second... Uh, Second big portion of the game, if that makes sense. Second dungeon so like, or whatever. Yeah, sec- second section. Like I've, I've saved the first person, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which, by the way, that demo, that PSX demo, is deceptive hmm. of how much is in between that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because well, finished... I remember playing that sequence. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We we did the demo as kind of like a um, vertical slice or something. Yes. And we're like, uh, this was like a year ago. Actually, we showed kind of that demo at, not this, not last PSX, but the one before that. Oh wow, really? Uh, yeah, like 2014. Damn. And we're like, okay, we could do a like a two three hour game, mm-hmm. like fleshing this out a little bit. But like, we feel we have something going on here. So then development took longer because we actually made a longer game. Like the size of the game is closer to Guacamole. It's about the same. Yeah, it seems pretty enormous, even though, it, it, like Guacamelee, involves all the backtracking and, like, there's these dungeon-crawling segments. But you do mm-hmm. actually, you, you do recycle through all the environments, and it's different each time because you add all these Metroidvania kind of elements, right, of, like, you you get the eye power. I just got the eye power, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so now you can access a bunch of things. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We wanna we wanted to do, like, a exploratory kind of mm-hmm. game, not just, like, the arenas or the enemies, Seems like a hallmark that you guys have taken on since uh, Guacamelee, that's for sure. Yeah, I think it's something like we just gravitate towards because that's right. the stuff we like in that's games. Exactly. Hey, I love that too. Like yeah. I, I say this all the time in every like little interviews that like Castlevania particularly is one of my favorite franchises of all time. Mm-hmm. So Symphony yeah. of Night and that kind of like uh, Metroidvania elements are amazing. So definitely, thank you, definitely. thank you for making those uh, genres stay alive. Oh yeah, <laughs> Symphony of the Night is like yeah. a game that keeps coming up uh, all yeah, the time in the tears, studio because yeah. like we're big fans of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually wanted to ask, so you are the concept lead at Drinkbox. What exactly yes. does that entail for you day to day on on like day one of the development to launch? Like what have you been doing exactly for those that don't know what a concept lead is? Yeah, so um, what I do is I do uh, – I'm one of the artists in the art team. Yeah. And uh, I come up with um, just ideas for projects and stuff like that. So for Guacamole, I pitch – uh, uh, the f- initial idea for that, and nice. same same for Severed. So it's kind of like a bit of world building, fleshing out uh, story, characters, Ooh, wow. um, ideas for uh, mechanics and levels and stuff like that. That I'm not like a puzzle designer, but right. it's more like the uh, the intangible side of it. Like so the, I you're the ideas feel... guy. Yeah, if that's a thing, because like yeah. I think that's a. Uh, a, a bit of a weird or a bit of a misnomer because mm-hmm. uh i don't i don't think uh idea people exist like i don't i don't no, no, believe no. in that uh i just think it's uh it's more the execution but i see my job as like more inspirational in a way uh-huh. like if i can create um like distill a concept or something into um uh, package it in a way that it will resonate with people like mm-hmm. this sort of nightmarish quest of Sasha, this one armed girl trying yeah. to figure out what happened with her family and then some visuals of this nightmare world. And then maybe that for like uh, the level designers or the other, uh, my teammates, mm-hmm. they'll be like, Oh, this sounds interesting. We could do this or this or this. And then kind of the ball gets rolling and it's sort of, uh, my job is trying to keep kind of like a sort of like an internal consistency in logic throughout right. throughout that. So it depends. Like at the beginning, it's a lot of sort of those new things like, okay, like it's touch screen combat, uh, but like it'd be great if instead of fighting one on one, you're fighting like multiple enemies. And as Thanks just for the idea. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it's kind of like that. And like, oh, it'd be cool if like, you know, and then like the stuff like the severing. Mm-hmm. kind of becomes wow. part of that and we prototype and it's like oh this is great so then uh we tie in the limbs to the economy and all that kind of follows from that but the idea of like feeling like a cool warrior in like this inhospitable land kind Bizarro of like kind of nightmare lands the idea guy like kind of template that i was like making a, a comment on what i meant more by that is like you 
So I didn't even know the extent of your concept. So you actually, did you generate the story as well? Is it like more of a team basis where you're, you like communicate with everyone and you're asking like, well, what are we interested now for setting? Are you the guy that's almost like the narrative designer as well in a sense then? Or is it every kind of a team effort as well? It's shared. Uh, it's it's a bit shared, but um, I feel like uh, I, I bring in, the idea is kind of like a gap that I, I bridge in the studio yes. or I guess some other people in the studio are not as interested in that, but mm-hmm. I am very interested. So I will come up with uh, some of these ideas, but it's not like they just put me in a corner and I come up with everything. It's like <laughs> I, I, I start I start a discussion and we had like kind of like a story contingents or something and uh, like, you know, I don't know, mm-hmm. three or four people in the team. Sometimes it depends who's busy. Someone like would stop going to story meetings because they need to like <laughs> write some prototype or something yeah. they're needed for something else um and everybody's opinion is uh it's um taken in consideration when when doing this so it's not like hey here this is the law or whatever it's exactly. more like if any great idea comes from anybody even though they're not doing the story section mm-hmm. they have a great suggestion we will put it in if it's the, the best thing to do so it's kind of it's a discussion and um, the story elements are really hard to pull mm-hmm. off, uh, especially. Hey, I have to say that challenge. you guys have been pulling it off incredibly well, and I, I will oh, get to that later you. in the interview as well. Like, I really have some comments on specifically your framing. Like, there's some fantastic framing that you guys did in the very beginning oh, that thanks. was so minimal. And like, as a, I'm a writer myself, so <laughs> I, I was a, I was a sucker for all the narrative design of this. So yeah, so you know how tough it is to yeah, uh, oh, <laughs> pick absolutely. the right words. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so so that was a lot of fun uh, to flesh out the world and the lore and all that. And then the That's hard part, part right? I feel, is uh, picking what to mm. expose in the little lines of dialogue or in the visuals that, that we we have. So yeah, it's like uh, everybody I feel in the team kind of ends up wearing multiple hats as mm-hmm. the production goes. So to go back to your question, like, the concept part is a lot of brainstorming at the beginning and a lot of sort of world world building at the beginning. Uh, like who is this person and like fleshing out and doing like some bios that just flesh out the characters and might not be relevant for the story, but it is relevant for us internally. And then it, it goes, when it starts to go into production, then, you know, talking to Steph, who's the art director and making choices on how we want to pursue the art or talking with the animators and figuring out uh, how to do some of these things. Uh, and then kind of, you, you kind of feed off each other and then you move forward. And then at the end of a project, you're just pumping out content and putting out fires and making sure <laughs> that's that a the, good way of putting development, right? The term. Yeah, right? definitely. Cause then, cause a lot of times you're like, Oh, I really want to fix this. And then six months later, it's like, I didn't get a chance to because something else was more important all the time. Uh, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a very dynamic thing. So mm-hmm. constantly, you know, at some points I'm just like making animations and just making, uh, art, uh, just content. And sometimes like, you know, you're in story meetings or playing the game to see if the narrative is flowing fine or mm-hmm. if even the game is flowing fine, like, oh, this secret's not that great, or maybe we can do a shortcut here, or maybe this arena feels like like the difficulty spike is too much or et cetera. So yeah. it's kind of like a, a bit of everything. So like you said, everyone wears the, the uh, different hats. Everyone's like kind of a joker of all trades in the studio. And that's kind of cool because mm-hmm. the fluidity of a small studio like yourselves like allows for that. Do you feel that way? Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, everybody's good at different things and there's mm-hmm. something that they excel at. And so like uh, I think my, my, strong, my strengths are on the – conceptual side and kind of like the initial part of the production how did you find yourself at drinkbox in the first place and where did you refine your artistic sensibilities because it does feel like and that's what i really appreciate it feels like when you are creating these concepts first and foremost the characters and the narrative is at the heart which is very (laughs) interesting for like a game if you think about it like i feel like more when it comes to a game obviously people focus on the the technical side like did the idea for the severing Mm. come after the story yeah, it came after. Wow, okay. uh, the original thing, I always try to start with something that speaks to me in like a sort of a universal level in a mm-hmm. way, the even if level. it's something simple. Yeah, yeah, for example, in Guacamole was, I just want to draw 
Mexico because I was feeling so nostalgic. Uh-huh. And like, that's valid. And the game ended Absolutely. up being kind of like a love letter to Mexico and to old games in a way. Yeah, and that's something that it was just kind of not planned because we were not like too experimented on making games <laughs> <You know? laughs> like doing the narrative that you know that we want to get that level but it kind of seeped through and so this time around I was thinking a lot about uh like being away from my family in a way and like oh, okay. about memories and how those kind of shape who you are and that kind of thing um I had a distinct moment uh, at the end of Guacamole where I was talking the phone with my mom um and it's just me basically pacing on my cell phone around the room uh wow. and she mentioned something uh that she had told me like a month before uh and it was great advice and my memory for that advice it was also me pacing around my room on my cell phone wow. so it was like a really weird feeling to have like great r- really nice moment yeah. uh that was like an emotional important moment um great advice but the image is just like the same because i realize like it, this person doesn't have to be next to me physically mm. uh and it's been like that for some years in a way i mean i go back but like you know uh a lot of these phone conversations or skype calls or whatever Absolutely. are are like they also shape you um so i cannot tell you what you know what was her hairdo or what she was <laughs> wearing or yeah what we were doing later or whatever, but uh, that resonates. So, you know, it starts from like an abstract point there. And then I think I was reading a lot of like Berserk, the manga. And, oh my like, God. I was just, oh, you, you know what? <laughs> I totally saw that in the, yeah. the guy who gives you the sword. I totally mm-hmm. saw Berserk. I was going to ask you if that was influencing it. Oh, yeah. Man. And like, and like at the too. same time, yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, I was not, it's not a conscious thing. I think yeah. somebody in the studio had mentioned maybe Chris Harvey or something. One of the founders like, Oh, it'd be cool to do a touchscreen game. And I'm like, huh, I never thought about that. Absolutely. And then kind of everything kind of coalesced into this idea, this, whatever you call it, like a soup and it's simmering. <laughs> a creative soup. Let's call it. That. Yeah. And yeah, like, like you're, that. you're finishing guacamole and like at the end, it's not like creative. You just like, again, putting out fires and creating content and fixing things. Uh, so, you know, those creative juices are just like mm-hmm. being hold in this dam or whatever. And then when that finishes, you kind of like let the floodgates and it kind of becomes something. Absolutely. And from there, um, yeah, what I came up from there was like something that involved some kind of memory or some kind of family and uh, this sort of lone warrior, uh, like this broken person in a way. And uh, and just these images started forming mm-hmm. and uh, and the, the touchscreen, like a first person – touchscreen game where you also navigate um I, i'm a fan of infinity blade uh and i i Fantastic wish there game. was more yeah, yeah and i wish there was more exploration so it's like oh it'd be cool to do one like that and what if you're surrounded by enemies like a bruce lee movie or something <laughs> and then or from that it's like all those enemies like I exactly yeah. <laughs> it's a tough game uh, the checkpoints so, are forgiving, though. I have to say that, and I'm very thankful there for that. As I'm reviewing the game, and I'm like, okay, thank God there's these checkpoints because I died at least three times during this one. Like the first section where you uh, yeah. where you start integrating like upgrades on speed and the boosting, and you actually have to nice. learn how to use the um the the eye power. Very tough yeah. to learn that learning curve at first. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. fun. It's uh, it's it, yeah, we fun. didn't want to make it like too casual you know i'm surprised like, how difficult it is to be honest like it's not we're not talking dark souls it or gets like intense that, it gets yeah it gets intense, intense. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah and i love it it's so engrossing like i've never felt a and this is gonna be like such hyperbolic statement but like for a touchscreen game i've never felt so immersed honestly in, well in like, i feel like so i feel like there's a stigma that we had to fight doing this because yes. we never thought that was gonna be an issue like mm-hmm. When some of the studios said, like, oh, make a touchscreen game, and then, like, uh, I proposed doing this, like, multiple enemy combat game, right. we never thought uh, that was not going to work because we just see it as inputs, and we just see, like, huh. this input's perfect because, like, totally. well, you know, for Ninja Infinity Blade, those, those things, like, there's, like, you can do crowd management, you can do combos, you can do, 
like cool things with it. It's actually maybe more immediate because it's your finger doing the work. It not, feel, and not... it also just feels more visceral for the themes and playing into the exactly. idea of you severing. Like I totally felt when I was playing the game, I was like, this is a this is a choice not only as a gameplay mechanic that is fun and actually works, but also mm-hmm. like for the world, it does make sense since that is exactly what she's doing. So honestly, yeah. you, what what you guys managed to achieve here was something that. I think um, when it comes to like technology, like a mobile game, like it has that stigma, like you said. I think it's going away. I think we honestly are in an era where it's finally going away. There's some great games coming out on mobile. Uh, I've been playing a lot of Kingdom Hearts recently, the, the mm-hmm. new Kingdom Hearts uh, key game, for example, on mobile mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But when it comes to touchscreen games in general, I think you guys prove that it's it's a matter of like showing people like, okay, this you can have a traditional gaming experience, a hardcore gaming experience as well, which is what I would consider severed to be. Definitely, with, it is. It yeah. is kind of like in the wheelhouse of. Um, of of drink box in that sense uh-huh. right like we wanted to have like an engaging hardcore game that was yes. like challenging for people uh and a lot of people at the beginning like they start to dismiss it because you had touch controls but i don't think they're like looking ahead of what touch controls can be mm-hmm. or they're just thinking uh, like a different genre of games not because of instead of looking at the inputs by themselves right yes like I, I don't know. I don't know how else to explain it, but uh, <laughs> basically, it, it kind of took me by surprise. People dismiss it. It's like it's clearly a dungeon crawling fantasy hardcore kind of intense, uh, colorful game. Yeah. Uh, so like we're not we're not doing a match three. So no, not, you know not what remotely. I mean. So it's like, why are you? <laughs> what's maybe what's a match the... three like organs in order to upgrade your character? Who's <laughs> I don't Definitely. know. <laughs> definitely it's very yeah. a, a very vis- visceral kind of kind of theme it's probably one of the most visceral experiences and i was mentioning this too and i know people might get on my ass for this in this interview but uh hmm. i i mentioned this way back in december when we first met that this is the reason why i'm dusting off my vita and this feels like the first exclusive in a while for me to actually <laughs> uh make me of course turn on the console but also feel like this is this uses the vita to its full potential in a lot of ways like i genuinely felt that and did you guys consciously choose the Vita? Like, what, what made you guys choose the Vita over, like, say, iOS and inevitably any ideas of porting to, like, PS4 since it's a touchpad and stuff like that? What what made you guys focus on the Vita, which is kind of like a, now just a niche indie platform, it feels like, which is great, but different. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, we've done really well on the Vita. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, well, we launched, uh, we launched Mutant Bluffs Attack on the yeah. Vita. Uh, we did uh, Guacamole was a cross buy. We actually sold more on the Vita in Europe than PS3 for Guacamole. Oh wow, that's impressive. Um, yeah, so we've done really well. Uh, we're like a relationship with Sony, and we didn't set up to do a Vita game. We set up to do a touch based experience, and okay. we realized that the Vita just was great with the thumbsticks and mm-hmm. uh, just the, the control just looked great. And so we went with that, and it was uh, sort of a f- more familiar space we didn't want to alienate a lot of our fan base because we're doing something very different from right. like a hardcore metrovania platforming kind of game mm-hmm. um so it's also like in the business sense you don't want to um risk it all with something completely new so you kind of want to bridge the gap so you don't want to skew your audience in a lot of ways like you said <laughs> exactly because yeah. it is a, a very different game um, oh, it's, so, I haven't played anything like it to be honest. Like, I guess the yeah. closest analog would be something like Etrian Odyssey or some first-person dungeoneering game. But even then, uh, it still feels so different because it has the puzzle, sure, but as uh, of an Etrian Odyssey. But the just the combat and the mechanics and uh, the way you were talking about how you made a deliberate choice of having this intense visceral combat between multiple <laughs> enemies, enemies at the same time. Like, it feels like all these active time battles in a Final Fantasy game are going off simultaneously. And it's, it's an incredible experience once it starts flowing and you get the flow of it all. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah that was hard to figure out because of how much genre blending there is, yeah. right? Like, it was not obvious that we were making, uh, or at least for me, it was not obvious that we were making a dungeon crawler until mm-hmm. later. Like, I, I remember a lot of discussions early about trying to make an exploration game like Mist or something, but mm-hmm. also a combat game. Mm-hmm. And we're like, can you do both? And then you're like, oh, of course, Zelda has done it <laughs> since the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Action adventure, of course. And, and then it you're feels like, a lot like yeah, that but in the in the combat hard. as well, doesn't it? With the the way that the pacing of the the battle goes, it feels like an NES game, kind of the boss battles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. In a way, it's kind of like you get 
like you see where the battles are going to be and and you start to plan your routes and yes. exploring around yeah yeah definitely uh, as uh, i think we struck a good balance on totally kind of did. the puzzle secret versus the action combat uh but yeah it was like deliberate work that went into that so we've been talking already for now a good 30 minutes and i want to congratulate us on like i haven't even been on script at all like i had so many questions and we've just been naturally been answering them the entire time <laughs> so this great. is great it's kind good of interview. Job, We're just having a conversation <laughs> But You're I do up, actually up. have some specific like uh, comments on the art style, which is obviously like the most stark element of the game. And mm-hmm. uh, who was the lead uh, artist, by the way, on this? Uh, the, the art team it was mainly uh, Steph Goulet. He's the okay. art director, right. uh, concept lead. So I, you know, we need to be on the same page exactly. for <laughs> these things. But we both like very graphic, colorful. Uh, stylized art. Since I see South the American games. like mestizo stuff in it as well, like that. And yeah, we wanted to do it's so grab yeah. bag of culture. Like it has Greco-Roman stuff in it as well. Definitely, we wanted to look at a lot of different cultures because uh-huh. we thought, okay, we're doing a fantasy world, but that doesn't mean we get to just like do Tolkien again. Yes. You know, it's been like <laughs> it's like it, which is great, which I love. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but there's a chance to do something completely uh, different. So and also we didn't want to uh, do a specific culture because uh, with guacamole it was like a lot of uh, work to be very specific. This is Mexico, right, or a fantasy version of Mexico. But uh, there was a logic already there, like um, a, a sort of policing that you had to do mm-hmm. uh, on on the cultural front. But with this, we thought, okay, let's make make it up and let's make the characters. Uh, you know, like mixed, uh, ambiguously mixed race, and uh, yeah. let's make the culture that feels real, but it borrows from Western, from Eastern influences. So we're looking at uh, a lot of different things. Like, yeah, we were looking at um, Greek Greek culture for a bit. We're looking at you know, like Cambodian temples, and mm. obviously some Latin American stuff. Yeah. Uh, that gets seeped in uh, Japanese things. And... Absolutely felt that with the berserk design of the main. I, I swear, <laughs> when I saw that, I was going to ask you that. That was a question like down here. Is like, is this the? Is this? I can't remember his name right now. Is this the Skull King or whatever his name is from uh, from Berserk? And I was like, uh, it oh, looks like it. I don't know. You know who I'm Maybe talking about? It... The guy with the brain, the big brain in Berserk. Uh, let me, I'm just now we're gonna, now we're just doing a quick. Uh, sorry guys, we're gonna pause the interview. <laughs> oh my god, I didn't I didn't get that far in Berserk. Oh, did, okay. I don't want to spoil it for you. Did you watch the show at all? The anime? No, no, no. I, no, I didn't watch the anime. I just read the manga up until like, well, I don't know. It was a bunch, but Did you maybe. get past the, the arc, though, where Griffith is, you know, so Griffith, something happened? Something happened with Griffith? <laughs> oh, I don't remember. Oh, man. That must have been a long time ago. But anywho, yeah. yeah. I, totally, I totally saw it. It was Japanese like three years ago. <laughs> right, right. I, I, watched, I watched the anime like a few episodes uh, but then something else came up, and then I stopped. Well, to be honest, the anime is only – they've been only animating the same part of the arc for, like, years. So finally, they're actually making a new series this July. So you should check that out, uh, actually. Get I will. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, but anywho, uh, I noticed that, too. You, you talk about how you were trying to make it um, a, a, a refined culture, like a culture that feels like it's lived and exists and has its entire history. And I definitely felt mm-hmm. that. And there is a lot of Vaz, so you could definitely feel that Greek influence. But I also mm-hmm. noticed that you guys really focused on um, environmental storytelling. And you did that in uh, Guacamelee Definitely. as well. There, there was a lot of humor in Guacamelee, right? It was a lot of memes. But with Severed, yeah. it totally uses it a lot differently. Like, it emphasizes the more of the, like, the colors obviously are really saturated. But it's in a grim, dark, like, kind of surrealist, almost. It reminded me a lot of, uh, if you ever read any uh, Borges or, like, Borges, like John Lewis I Borges. haven't. Okay, you should Yeah, I know who you're talking stuff. about. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very I surreal haven't. worlds, and it reminded me a lot of that. So how did you guys make that decision of, like, focusing on um, environmental storytelling? Was it more practical, or is that just your sensibility as a um, writer slash concept I, designer? I thought it would be easier to have less dialogue. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so like, let's make it go. easier for ourselves. It was actually tougher. Mm. <laughs> really? So, uh, yeah, because um, with with – it doesn't mean to do less story. It just yes. means that you cannot be direct with the story. So you really need to make an effort choosing what to say. Mm-hmm. Like the characters in Guacamole are very uh, deliberate on who they are and they tell you right away. They felt but kind of like here, uh, comic we characters, wanted... a lot of them. Exactly. Yeah. It's like a comic book or like, a, uh, I don't know, like a, like an op- operatic kind of yes. kind of storytelling, you uh-huh. know. Uh, but with this, we wanted a more subdued realistic kind of like 
uh, you know, the the spaces between the words are like they're saying something also. Mm. And that was very tough because like there's not that many interactions. We wanted the world to feel alien and a bit lonely in a way. It totally does. Uh, like, you accomplished that. I feel very <laughs> yeah. <achieving> that. <laughs> But yeah, it was at the cost of saying, okay, well, we have all these cool backstories and all these cool things, but we can't because they're expensive to do. Or like if we do it visually, they're expensive. Or if we do it with words, then it kind of loses that uh, atmosphere element to it. So it was like, okay, let's just pick our spots and really curate that sentence or two that we have here and we have there. So that was... Uh, that was tough, but that was a deliberate thing. It just felt like the game benefited from... The game was constantly better with the less things we said. I really right. appreciate that. I like the yeah. like the yeah. art style in and of itself. It really flows into the minimalism of the game. But specifically, <laughs> I noticed, that... too, that um, your your characters, like, you have... The, obviously, Sasha, she doesn't talk. And the, so far, mm -hmm. I'm not far... I'm obviously not the completion of the game, so maybe she does say something. I don't know. You want to tell me right now. Do do humans talk in this game at all, or is it all the monsters? I've been noticing that. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything. Okay, don't spoil it. Um, all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. I uh, don't spoil it anyways. But, but yeah, was there yeah, a conscious just, effort just to through. focus on the characters, like the, the side characters, like the monsters, like the crow, specifically in the first part of the game? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we needed someone to sort of guide you and tell you something. Because, yes. like, I feel like we had something very interesting and, like, we didn't have any vehicle to show this. Um, and at some point, you cannot rely on just the backgrounds to tell all of that because right. everything's in constant flux where you're making the levels and things like that. And... Um, it's just kind of new territory for us as well. So, um, yeah, we opted uh, to use some NPCs uh, and that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, at, we didn't want to sacrifice the, yeah, again, the atmosphere and the, mm -hmm. the sense of, like, you're playing as Sasha and Sasha doesn't know what's going on and she feels like everything's against her and she's doing all these brutal actions too like i can't imagine what it must be like in her head like that's why again yeah. the touchscreen mechanic really does it was just a brilliant kind of one of those things that just happens on the development floor right where you guys weren't planning it but mm -hmm. it, it it plays into your guys's trope so well or like not trope but like into the themes of the story so well being like yeah listening. definitely i think yeah. and touching on the art direction thing that you were mentioning yes. earlier uh, we deliberately wanted the design of the world and the design of the enemy specifically to feel, uh, I mean, I'm overusing the word visceral, but I, I know we are. It, <laughs> yeah. But I, I that, but that was kind of like a, a, a word that we used a lot doing this. Like I wanted uh -huh. the, the enemies to feel icky because you're touching the screen and like, yeah, the door, it's, the, the it's doors. not, you know, there's, there's some stuff that you don't kind of like, I remember being a kid in the, my grandma had this like amazing kind of encyclopedia of books and stuff like that. And there was a page that was like, every time there's a page with like worms or something, it's like, you don't even want to no, turn the page. No. <laughs> and there was one with like a deep, uh, deep sea creatures. Yeah. And the illustration, it was just jam packed as though wow. you just grab a net full of like tuna or something, but it was a tuna. It was like this, like, weird sharks and things like that mm -hmm. so it's like just getting to that page and just flipping with your finger there was something like not like a feeling of uh uh whatever like uh, uncertainty or mm -hmm. uh, ickiness or something kind of unsettling, and i wanted right? to have that yeah exactly that's that's the word like unsettling feeling and uh i remember i, I thought uh it was a great success when a couple of the programmers didn't want to work on a couple of uh, the <laughs> enemies because they they kind of got grossed out a little bit. Wow. So I'm like, okay. I mean, it's clearly the way we bridge is by making it colorful and very graphic. So I don't think it's like um, uh, a gory kind of game. Not at all. Um, I doesn't feel like that, but it, it does have that uh, that factor that is slightly unsettling. Or if you picture it in a realistic way. Yeah, be, that's, that's like, what I was going to say. Yeah, picture it in a real way, and yeah. it's disturbing what you're seeing on screen. Exactly. So <laughs> by making it more stylized, we actually are able to get away with uh, pretty stark imagery, as you put it. Yeah, and I noticed, too, with the environmental storytelling in particular, you guys focused on, um, with the first boss, uh, the Crow Golem, you focused on like kind mm -hmm. of detailing their story through mosaics. 
And yes. it, I haven't got far enough yet to find the second boss or what we would consider mm-hmm. the second boss. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating, though, that you guys are developing the bosses in, as, like, kind of sympathetic characters in a lot of way. Like, you're, you, you tell the story not through dialogue, through these, like, little cross-shaped rooms. Which I don't know if that was a deliberate design as well, <laughs> the cross-shaped room that it's located in. Um, but, yeah, was, was there a reason behind, like, did you guys have a goal of developing each boss as its own character as well? Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay. They're like big players in the in the game, so we wanted to give them. Uh, there is like full lore behind it, nice. um, but also like there's a challenge to doing too much of the lore, where it is like it's like too little, it's ambiguous, and it's not engaging, and too much is just like annoying. Mm-hmm. So you kind of want to hit a, a moment where it's like I bet there's something else, and like I'm trying to get the full picture, but not everything is revealed Absolutely. but there is an internal uh, logic to these areas and and these characters and i hope that comes through i don't know I'm oh, curious it, it to did. i can tell you right now out. i did <laughs> okay great yeah uh yeah and something that is an opportunity as well to reinforce the theme of the game right. uh, of the game uh something that resonates with the main character's quest something that resonated well. with me actually in particular too was the the focus obviously all these monsters are like bizarro like just human forms a lot of them are lacking human creatures but a lot of them actually i've been noticing there's a huge focus on eyes in particular in my own writing not to make this at all like about that stuff but in my own writing i like to focus a lot on eyes as well so i really noticed that motif can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that is that like a conscious effort over all the with the when a game uh like severed is all about severing body parts i just noticed mm-hmm. that like eyes in particular like even the loading screen the little dongle <laughs> the little yeah. swirling eye that's that's an eye yes. as well so is there an emphasis there for that uh, yeah, I don't think it was like a conscious thing at the beginning, but then you start to see some themes and start to mm-hmm. uh, try to bridge the gap and make it uh, a more concrete sort of like we didn't want to do anything just random, but mm-hmm. it, it felt it felt right and it made sense for yes. uh, for the character and that kind of thing. So yeah, there's yeah there's some stuff to chew. I hope, uh, and from what I hear, it's like being successful. I'm totally yeah. reading into all these different symbols. Like I'm making like theses in my head of like, okay, maybe the eyes mm-hmm. represent like, oh, okay, maybe it represents you peering into her soul, peering into her character. The mirror mm-hmm. in particular, um, the mirror framing mm-hmm. device that you guys keep using, it, yes. it's so effective in showing her loss of humanity over time. And I was that as a as a writer, mm-hmm. I was like digging that. Idea. Yeah, that was that was super cool when that tech went in. Because yes. uh, yeah, you definitely um you need to see her and uh-huh. like um you know, instead of doing like a third person cutscene at the beginning, mm-hmm. uh having the mirror be the reveal, I think it's uh yeah, because we wanna put you in, in her shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh I mean she's barefoot, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Never gets feet, no monster feet. We'll uh, you should keep playing. Okay, I will. I'm gonna keep playing. This. <laughs> see, we're, we're we're in a weird line right now where I played a decent amount of the game, but I'm not towards the yeah. end yet. So it's yeah, like, I oh, think uh, I think that's perfect because then we don't need to spoil anything. Right. But that you is. get like a good taste of of what it uh, it's like to be in this world. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And uh, maybe moving a little bit away temporarily from the uh, monsters and game design and stuff like, like mm-hmm. that, I want to focus on actually how how did you guys come into contact with the composer? And I'm going to butcher this probably mm-hmm. horribly, but Yamataka Sonic Titan. Yeah, Yamataka Sonic Titan. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And also uh, uh, a Filipino percussion band called Pantayo also. Ooh, okay, I didn't helped. see, I didn't find that. Yeah, they're they're both uh, collaborated awesome. uh, on that. They, they work together uh, like uh alaska alaska b uh from yamantaka sonic titan Mm -hmm. and uh we would meet with her and tell her the direction show her concept art and things like that and then they would go away and then they come back (laughs) and like the music is like oh my god you nailed the feeling exactly (laughs) yeah uh we were big fans of their work at the studio it's a it's a toronto band uh polaris nominated band yes and um we were just at pre-production. We were just doing concepts and um, and we were looking at their music and their music, I felt, along with some other members of the teams, that it fit really well with the, mm-hmm. uh, with the, the feel of this world. So we used uh, one of our songs as the first trailer, actually. We cut the, mm-hmm. the, the trailer to their music. Um, and then we asked them to... Uh, 
you know, we we met them and see if they were interested in making a game. They had done some game uh, game soundtrack a, a bit before. They did a song for Mark of a Ninja. Ooh, okay. Uh, for Clay, uh, and they're huge gamers, so. Yeah, it seemed uh, like a, it seemed like a gaming soundtrack mixed with a lot of uh, progressive rock. That's why that's why exactly. I really was There's some the progressive rock elements of it all. Definitely, uh, yeah. for people that don't know, is this kind of haunting, uh, sort of folkloric uh, kind of uh, prog rock? Yes, uh, yeah. It's it's just great. It's just folkloric great music. Prog rock. That should be a genre. Mm-hmm. I want that to be a thing. <laughs> it is. They're making it. <laughs> that They're amazing. Our, so so it was more of a situation where you guys sought them out then. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We took them out, and then um, yeah, through uh, uh, to, through Factor, who uh, is like a, a program to kind of music with Toronto bands or to Ontario bands mm-hmm. or, or Canadian bands. I don't know. Uh, basically, we were able to to fund that the music, and uh, we were really happy with the soundtrack. I yeah. think they like every time we were not sure about an area or something. Uh, we would just communicate in a really vague feel like, oh, this is the home. This is how it should feel. And <laughs> I don't know. And then immediately, like, they're getting ideas. And then the track comes back and That's it's awesome. like, oh, my God, this is actually this is better than we were thinking isn't that the greatest <laughs> thing that like, i feel like that's only particularly something that a creator can do as well like it shows how creative mm-hmm. they are because they they took your abstract concepts and made something out of it like that you gave yeah them. and made it made it better and yes. uh yeah and it's fun they 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 made um each area kind of has its track and it has like a uh, exploration version and a combat version and that's they kind of like, i want to comment on that as well like the the, the <laughs> tonal differences like it speeds up as well when you're injured it seems like or and the, the boss theme of the crow in general was the first. Oh, one. Was like, fantastic! I, I was like, I was, I was like, almost trembling. I was like, oh, this is awesome! It made me, it made me have flashbacks of back when I was fighting uh, Sephiroth back in the day, uh, like in the final. Yeah, Fantasy they're it's awesome. Yeah, they're uh, big fans of Final Fantasy. So I can feel it. <laughs> I can see, yeah, and it, which is great because uh, the music is fantastic as well. It really is, and um, it's interesting because again, it's another Canadian area. But do you guys find that there's like uh, there's any advantages to being a Canadian developer as well? Like obviously you were able to come in contact with other Canadian artists like uh, Yamatanka. But like, what do you do, is there is there some unique benefit to being in Canada as a developer right now as opposed to primarily where a lot of indie games are developed now um, in America? Seems like I think so. I mean, I see that when I go to shows or you know like PSX or or GDC or something mm-hmm. uh, where there's a lot of Canadian people. There's a lot of Toronto people. Yes. And uh, I think it partly is because of the Ontario government or the Canadian government giving funds uh, to people to start their uh, their projects. Which Severed is supported in some capacity by that, isn't it? Yes, by the uh, OMDC and uh, CMF and uh, and like things like Factor and things like that. That's awesome. So that allows for kind of like... Um, um, sort of community of I- independent game developers mm-hmm. uh, to come out of that. So Toronto has a, a lot of those, and um, that's great because then you get inspired by each other. You see, you know, down the street, there's a couple of studios that are doing great things, and mm-hmm. you see them elsewhere in other show or in the states. And uh, it's nice to see like people, you know, from from where you live <laughs> elsewhere <laughs> yeah. making great stuff so there's a, a sense of community that 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 kind of funding has uh has triggered and i, I think you know some other places have that i i think you know like uh some cities in the u.s also have that like i think it's san francisco uh, yeah absolutely i mean you and, were here back in december and that must have been a long exactly time for you guys. did you guys fly in here or drive yeah I went back to San Francisco for GDC, actually. Oh, did you? Oh, we, yeah, we flew uh, a awesome. direct flight. See, I had so, to. Yeah. I, I was at uh, SVCC. <laughs> I was at Silicon Valley Comic Con covering that mm. event. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to go to GDC. It was my first time in like three years not being able to go. But uh, oh, I, I missed you guys. Did you guys bring the same demo to GDC as well? Yeah, yeah, we okay. bring the same demo. Yeah, that's not. We didn't like. We're finishing, so we didn't have time to like polish. But, you know, I think that vertical slice or does exactly like that. job, though, right? Like that, that, yeah. that feels that is the game that you feel and get later on, really. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's just like that fleshed out and uh, I think improved. Because uh, I think uh, in the demo you have to kind of nerf it a little bit. Mm-hmm. 
because uh, people just in 15 minutes get to the boss fight, but in yes. the actual game, it's like a tougher boss. The, the pairing uh, mechanics in particular, uh, where did that come in? Was that just a natural decision from the get-go, or did you guys have to implement that later? Because it felt which more like, that's like a fighting mechanic, really. Oh, the pairing? Yes, the pairing. Uh, that was from the beginning. Um, that was in the original pitch. Because okay. uh, I wanted to do like a very simple game. Like mm -hmm. doing touch controls, wanted very intuitive. I didn't want a lot of button mashy kind of things. Uh, so, and the character from the beginning had one arm. So I'm like, it's perfect. She doesn't need a shield. She doesn't roll around. She doesn't dodge. She just like attacks and then mm -hmm. when she's under attack she attacks as well and then she gets to parry <laughs> the one thing we changed is that i was picturing the parry as being perpendicular to the to the attack yeah yeah because i just feel like like, like a swords kind of crossing paths yes but uh that proved to be not uh it didn't work at all in the <laughs> one of those mechanics that just <laughs> was like, had so... to be burned yeah, no, it was just counterintuitive yeah. to do it like that. Way. So we actually did it. You have to go against the the attack uh, angle. Uh, but it's still the same thing. It's just changing it 90 degrees. And that was... Because people <laughs> were doing that anyways. Yeah. So we're like, oh, there's no reason for us to do it perpendicularly. It needs to be, like, in line. Uh, and that, you know, that's the kind of thing you flesh out in the combat system. But... Yeah, that worked. That worked from the beginning. Pairing uh, was so much fun. That's awesome. I mean, I'm a huge uh, Street Fighter 3 fan, so if you ever played Third Strike, there, there's a lot of pairing based in that. Um, oh, yeah. I just remember that um, uh, it's not Street Fighter 3, but like that that Evo uh, comeback. Oh, Evo 37, Moment 37. Yeah, oh, yeah, my God. Absolutely. Um, that was – pairing is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Isn't it? That's, that's my favorite thing too. Like Last Blade, uh, if you yeah. ever played the SNK like Neo Geo game, I love the way they do deflecting in that too. So, oh, I haven't. That, the, hey, it's coming out on PSN, so pick it up. But uh, okay, great yeah. game, great game. But anywho, I actually – speaking of the pairing mechanic as well, you guys did a really good job of fleshing that out very early on in the tutorial sequence. And I wanted mm -hmm. to ask like where – so they go – If again, it feels like you guys uh, put – an emphasis on narrative in the first place so where did that flashback sequence in the first place like come was that like one of the first ideas did that come in later of like oh let's have it where we flesh out the family through a very short like mother daughter sparring session that's so cool yeah i think it was uh it was something that it was important for the character but also um it, i think it's again like hey we can add some interesting narrative here and like very subtle, like in like the mother needs to come across in just her character design and a couple of lines and her demeanor. And now I feel like you play the tutorial and you're like, OK, I get their relationship. I, you know, I understand a bit more about Sasha just by Absolutely. looking at that flashback. Uh, so that was from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and again, going into that kind of like the memories kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it proved to be too expensive to be going into memories all the time. Mm. Uh, but that, that tutorial one was important. Um, and and also it's a great contrast because you see monsters in the rest of the game. Yeah. And, you know, and it's nice to see, like, a human being. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> this warm sure. light and, like... And it's in a way, and the fact that you're using the same mechanics as the game and it's teaching you that, I think uh, it creates a, a strong character moment for her. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things that it just worked well, everything together. It, it uses the building blocks, I find, like of like just creative yeah. writing in general just so so well. And so like it, it, it works. Everything just plays into the, the severed uh, premise of you are going into this world that's uh, – so somewhat bizarre and i'm very curious to see like how did this world like come in like you know, come into play like how how were these why are were these monsters always existing or did something happen and that's something i hope the game will reveal mm -hmm. later on but how did you guys develop the human civilization in general uh without going too much into spoilers i guess yeah uh like, is there a name for I, this um no we did like different cultures in different sort of times okay. like we're thinking of this world as uh, a world that a lot of time has passed so mm. maybe some of these cultures didn't even see each other wow. like when they came in some might be ruins you know yeah like totally uh but it's some bigger some purpose because you're looking from the for the the main character's perspective so not of all not all the questions are answered but there is kind of like an internal logic again because mm. uh we we did think of these things and uh 
the world to make the world feel like a, a real place you kind of have to do that kind of behind the world scenes building. yeah yeah that world building so it's the, that, fun, that's that was the most part fun of, right yeah. that's the most fun part you have to admit i i love that part <laughs> um yeah i wrote a whole wiki on that stuff awesome. and um some of stuff didn't get through uh and some stuff is uh, not necessary nor relevant but it's nice yeah. to have it in a way so you have like you said I, i'm more of a, a planner when it comes to my writing as well so like do you, hmm. you have a wiki will that ever be made like public one day when like the game's well and old maybe one day or is it too, too many probably. notes that don't really make sense yeah probably not because yeah. it's old it's <laughs> like you started like you started when like we're doing some uh, like we need to start the world building yeah. phase and then like two months later it's like half of it is obsolete because mm-hmm. we didn't go with that direction because some totally of it didn't work or whatever and then it's like a lot of work to be updating it and like it kind of served its purpose at the beginning and then like <laughs> Again, you're putting out other fires, so it's like, yeah, you know, the wiki cannot be cleaned up <laughs> and hasn't been touched in a year and a half. But I do the same thing. You know, I have a huge document that. somewhere where it's just like these are ancient document ideas from when I was in high school for like a story I'm working on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and in a way, like the purpose is not to be published, it's just to give you a stepping stone yes. to reach whatever you want to reach at that point of the project. So that's more like how I see it. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. And you flesh out those characters so well with that background. Like you have to have that there. You have to know where, like where the mother came from, where the grandparents even came from. You have to look back three generations mm-hmm. for Sasha. But focusing mm-hmm. more on Sasha as a character herself, you, I, I noticed that you mentioned like how she's an ambiguous uh, culture or like ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Like she, she's obviously colored, so she's not like uh, the typical like Caucasian protagonist or anything like that. But where yeah. did, did that concern you think come from? Just your personal sensibilities, or what? Where, where did the character of Sasha come into like Genesis? Like how did you develop her? Um, I'm not, I'm not really sure. It was just, <laughs> yeah, because she just came in like yeah. that in a way. The only change was that uh, from the original concept, I just made her younger because we realized it was uh, more of a rites of passage story, mm. and it worked better if she was not like a twenty-something mature warrior, but someone that's still finding her place in the world. Yeah. So, okay. so I made her a bit younger for that as a it's just the story kind of demanded huh. that thing uh, but and that was fairly early in the in the process uh-huh. uh but aside from that um i don't know i just like i would like to see um more kind of diverse looking characters in, in in games and um yeah it's just kind of like a mix i don't know uh it, it's really there's no like a specific ethnicity mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people feel like latin american because of the bright colors and things like that yeah. but that was not necessarily like let's make her look latin american i feel like more so than uh, guacamole which is obviously an homage and love letter to mexico and like mexican culture this game mm-hmm. feels like we mentioned a little bit earlier like it has greco-roman architectural elements it has pyramid elements of uh south american and also egyptian culture I, I I think you guys accomplished a good job of just having this hybrid culture without necessarily defining who she is. I even see her more as like South Asian, if anything. Like it's it's hard. You don't want to obviously claim like or like put a put a title on her, but I I think you guys accomplished it well that she's not some she's not any of our real world cultures really. Yeah, yeah. and in a way, it's also uh, like you want to sort of stand out uh, from all the other characters. Mm-hmm. You want to make her look unique, and like sadly, there's not enough like quote-unquote ethnic looking Mm -hmm. people in video games so i think it's something that really like resonates uh with people as well that was kind of like just a byproduct of this this is not something that was like uh sort of imposed or anything it's just something like okay that's how it is and also like toronto i mean also with san francisco Mm -hmm. is like a very diverse very multicultural kind of kind of cities and it's just exactly so it's just kind of like in a way that's just an extension of that because like i look around the studio and like even even the the even people that like are white they don't say they're white you know they mm-hmm. they say like oh i'm half scottish or like or greek you know irish i have yeah exactly yeah. i have i have greek i have italian i have you know i have a, a spanish blood or whatever it is um so it really is not like uh that nobody approaches it that way nobody says like i'm generic you know what i mean <laughs> i'm just a mixed bag yeah. some people say they're mutts i guess but i think it's more comedic if anything 
Yeah, yeah. So when it's something like that, we're like you, you, you look around and you see people from different cultures, and that's something that I really enjoy in totally. in Toronto because, I, you know, in Mexico is like a lot of Mexicans, mm -hmm. uh, and you know the diversity is not as heightened as as like downtown Toronto or like even in the suburbs of Toronto where you get just like yeah that melting pot feel. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just also like an extension of, of that. Uh, and I, I don't, and it's something that is actually not like in the case of guacamole is relevant for the characters to be Mexican. Absolutely. But in this case, it's not really because it's dealing with like something that's much more universal and introspective at the same time for Sasha. Um, so that's why it's not a specific culture. I feel like this game already has so many psychological bombs that are about to explode. And it's weird that I say that because it's not necessarily some like mind bending. Like if you've ever seen Evangelion, it's not. It's not meant to be that <laughs> way in your head, right? It's not. I mean, it's abstract, obviously, in the visuals, and it's not trying to aid necessarily your comprehension yeah. of the story, but. The, at the same yeah, time, we're not gonna make we're not gonna make a game to explain the ending of the game. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you're not gonna make an end of Evangelion. You're saying for Severed. Yeah, we're not gonna do ten years from now release oh, another man. version. I, I was that... looking forward to end of Severed. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. The end of Severed. The end of Severed. Rebirth. <laughs> or death and rebirth. We'll, we'll have like a little death and rebirth. Season. Exactly. Oh man, that's uh, I, I love Evangelion. Yeah, Evangelion is uh, one of my favorite franchises but... of all time too. But I feel like you didn't need the extra movies. You know? <laughs> you, hey, I you love the first Don't ending. go watch 3.0. I'm telling you right now, don't watch okay. 3.0. I won't. Yeah, I won't. It's not very good. Uh, sorry for those oh. fans that are going to kill me now in the comments of Ava. <laughs> 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 I never thought Severed would involve so much Berserk and Ava. These, this is awesome. And uh, so, uh, that's why this interview has already gone on for an hour now. So I think we're actually going to uh, get close to wrapping this up. And I have one final question with you, uh, Augusto. So yeah. are you ready? Yes. Okay, so last question, possibly the easiest or maybe even the hardest. I've, I've asked this before to a few developers now, but what do games mean to you? Are they first and foremost art? Are they life, etc.? What do games mean to you and in your life? Go abstract um, as think, you want. <laughs> yeah, for me, for me, uh, well, like making games is kind of like uh, an expression kind of thing. Yes. You know, like... like uh, as a, as an artist or like someone that makes content, you just want to kind of share, hey, this are this is the stuff I'm feeling and what I'm thinking, and I cannot articulate it in words, mm -hmm. but I can spend three years making drawings and <laughs> you know, and then hopefully that resonates and well, that's yeah. kind of like an inspiration kind of thing. And when I play games, it's uh to do that to like in a in a way to feel connected, feel part of the world and see what other people are feeling and get those different points of view through a, through a medium that allows for that exploration in in a way that is uh hard to explain with just you know with just a, a few sketches or a few sentences so so for me i don't know it's it's um it's a playing is a necessary part of like human development. Yeah. And uh, when you get to elevate that into a form of communication, that's uh, it's more subtle and deep mm -hmm. Then I don't know, you get like a weird satisfaction out of that. Um, but for me, it's just like, kind of like th the sharing part. Like I don't make games and keep them in the hard drive. You know, it's, <laughs> it's meant, it's meant to be an experience that everybody takes it as their own experience and hopefully they'll enjoy it. Uh, hopefully there'll be like a weird connection from the developers to the players as the same way I feel as, as a player with games and media that I really yes. enjoy. I think with all artistic mediums, the goal is to have a silent communication with the people you are cons who is consuming your art or like yeah. experiencing with it. And I definitely feel with Sever that just hearing how personal and how much uh, resonance this has to you and your family and, how the the phone call analogy and all these other things it just with severed i already feel like rather than severing away and like getting like separating yourself from humanity it feels like this is a quest more of like you getting closure and more of us as the as the player uh for sasha like us getting closer to what it means for her to be back with her family like what she cares about so i think you exactly. accomplished that really well and you did you communicated all of that and uh i can't wait to beat the game i want to go play it right now <laughs> um um very happy that's communicating because that was so hard to do. <laughs> well, you did it perfectly. You guys did it really well. So I want to thank you, Thanks, Augusto. And uh, we'll talk. I'm sure we'll talk when the next game is coming out. And uh, I want to hear your concepts then, all right?
Yeah, let me know when you finish the game. All right, I sir, I, hey, I'll give you my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, thank you so much, okay. Augusto. Thank you, Hayden. Thanks for having me. Also, uh, we could follow you uh, at is it Kukso on Twitter? Yeah, Kusho. Kusho. Okay. Uh, Again, butchering yeah, it's, names. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's fine. That one's that one's a hard one. Right. Um, you... It's it's actually a nickname like Augustos are called Kushos in South. East Mexico for some reason. Oh, I never heard of that. That's interesting. Yeah, it's weird. Wow, it's not it's not as intuitive as uh, Michael Mike, but it's kind <laughs> of the same thing. No, no, not exactly the the same direction. It, it sounds <laughs> yeah. similar, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could also follow us if you guys want to hear more interviews, and eventually we'll do a review of it as well of Severed. Uh, you could go to viewbyte dot com, follow us at viewbyte dot com um, on Twitter, and also you can follow me at Hayden Robel if you want to hear me talk about uh, End of Severed, Death and Rebirth some more <laughs> <laughs> thank you thanks again Augusto. definitely thank you very much have a good one you too